Thank you for being here. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you in Berlin. And I've gained through the years an appreciation for many of the uh, cultural institutions and proud traditions here in Germany of uh, all different kinds. And I think perhaps the one that's most relevant to us this morning is Germany's worldwide reputation for engineering excellence across a wide swath of disciplines. And it's something that we can relate to, I think, um, in Google because there's a, there's a museum that's pretty close to the Google headquarters, just a few blocks away, where there's an exhibit to Konrad Zuse, uh, who uh, created here in Germany the world's first Turing complete computer, the programmable computer, the Z3, which I think is just a little bit smaller than a modern smartphone. Maybe it's a little bit bigger, actually. But uh, it's a really impressive accomplishment. At Google, we're all about engineering, and you see it in our products and projects of various kinds. Um, some of my favorites include Google Photos. I've got a, just thousands of memories. I've got a pile of kids, too. I've got eight young kids, and uh, actually my oldest is 14, so she's getting on in years. But uh, I oftentimes want to dive in and find memories that I, can, that I can dimly recall. And I love how with this product, I can just come up with a natural language expression and find exactly what I'm looking for. I also th I'm thinking about AlphaGo and uh, the achievements that we just shared earlier in the summer where we had the competition with Lee Sedol and sort of surprised the world with what's possible with general machine learning algorithms with this achievement. And of course, the self-driving car project, which has the potential to save us millions of hours and thousands of lives. The common thread between these particular projects and projects is machine learning is the ability for machines with the right algorithms and lots and lots of data to make inferences about new situations and new data that, 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 that they encounter. So at Google, I spend my time with developers. And what excites me about this narrative is the fact that we've taken the same technology that we've used in-house and we've made it open source and shared it with the world. And to make this effective, you have to spend time with TensorFlow and define your own models, and then you need lots and lots of data and lots of computation to get the sorts of inferences that you want out of it. And you can do all that on your own, but I love how we provide a gradual grading of solutions for you. So if you want, you can use Google Cloud Platform and to host uh, your own models and to host your own data and scale with you. But really, if you're not interested in any of this and you just want the end user benefits, you can also integrate with easy to use APIs such as cloud vision, speech, text, and translation that make it as simple as just a few lines of code to get the benefits of our models and our experience and our data in your application. I wanted to share this with you because I think it's a great example of how at Google, we're on a mission to make developers successful. And we do it with a bunch of different platforms and products, such as the Google Cloud Platform, such as Android, and with the Chrome browser, which is our contribution to the web platform and the web community. And just last month, we talked about some of the latest developments in this space. So we shared that we have uh, started shipping our own phone, the Pixel, running the latest version of Android. We shared more details about our VR platform, Daydream, which gives people an exciting and accessible way to experience high-quality virtual reality. We sort of took where we started with cardboard, which was a fun hack, and made it really, really, really reliable and really, really great. And we talked about Google Home and shared details about the developer program that's launching next month, which is one of our first services for the assistant. So these are some examples of what we're doing to partner with developers to be successful together. And it brings us to Firebase. I wanted to spend a few minutes before we go into some more of the details on why we're doing Firebase and what it means to us and, and what we hope it can do for you. So at Google, we have a lot of experience building some of the world's most popular applications. And we've learned a thing or two about what it takes to build an app as a result. And we found that it's a pretty difficult process. You know, fundamentally, at the core, you're going to have to create an application across multiple platforms, the web, iOS, and Android. And we see this space getting more complicated over the horizon as devices start to become more and more popular and more widely adopted, devices and new form factors. But this isn't even really where the complexity starts, in my opinion because user expectations for what's built on top of these platforms is getting higher and higher all the time. Think about authentication. 
if you want to really engage your users in today's landscape, which is really competitive, a lot of different apps, a lot of different platforms are competing for user engagement, you want to make the authentication process, the login process, as smooth as possible. And at the same time, it's more important than ever to have best practices for security um, in, your, in your authentication flow as well. And you'll want to integrate with third-party uh, sign-in providers as well. And so we're way beyond creating a simple login screen. There's a lot you've got to do for modern uh, authentication to work well. Increasingly, users expect to be able to collaborate with each other. And so you've got to think about the infrastructure to share data in real time across your applications, across platforms. And as another example, if you want to get the power of social media to drive discovery and re-engagement for your applications, you'll need to implement deep linking. These are just a few examples of the increasing complexity that are really just table stakes for modern application development. And this is where Firebase comes into the picture because we want to move development as much as we can from fighting over infrastructure, from thinking about all the different solutions that you have to choose from, learning how to implement them. And we want you to be able to spend all of your energy on bringing innovation and creativity, something new to the world. That's really what we're trying to achieve here, is making all the infrastructure pieces simple for you so that you can really apply your energy where it matters most. And so Firebase is a series of tools that help you develop your application and then help you bring users to your application and grow your user base and earn money as this happens, all tied together with an analytics product that is free and unlimited, that lets you analyze the, you know, instrument the snot out of your application, just put as many events as possible in there so you can see in detail what's happening. And these include products like Remote Config that make it really easy for you to have an application that dynamically changes its behavior based on what you know about your users and what you learn about your users. It has uh, the remote, da the real-time database that started it all that makes it so trivial to implement really sophisticated synchronization features in your application. And authentication, a product that takes what we've learned from doing billions of authentication sessions uh, uh, over the lifetime of, of Google and bringing those best practices to developers so they, th they can use them easily. Firebase is a collection of 15 different features across a variety of categories, all tied together with an easy-to-use console that lets you stay on top of the status of all your different projects and easily integrate them into your own, into your own uh, applications. So since launching Firebase, the new Firebase at Google I.O. this year, we're now up to over 750,000 developers using the product. And we have hundreds of the world's most popular applications who've adopted it including uh, three teams who are here today, uh, Alibaba, Glide, and, and, uh, and, uh, and The Economist. Can you guys raise your hands? Uh, so check out these teams that are here. I'd love for you to uh, speak with them and, and learn from their experiences. And we're really, really happy and honored to have such great partners on the platform. So Firebase is about helping you develop, grow, and earn. And since I.O., we have been busy building this out. We started really broad with a bunch of different features. And since I.O., we've been busily making it deeper and deeper, listening to feedback from the community, adding the long list of features that we want to see in the product, and we're continuing to grow this product more and more. And today at the summit, we're going to be talking to you about the latest features that we've added to Firebase, starting with Google Analytics, where my colleague Steve Ganim is going to come up just after me and talk to you more about it. But before I transition to Steve, I just wanted to say, Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being part of this journey. I'm really excited for you to have the opportunity to learn more about what we're doing with Firebase, to interact with the teams, and for us to learn from you. So please seek out those of us in the yellow shirts, give us your feedback, ask us your questions, and I'm really excited for you to engage with Firebase and see how it can make you more successful. Thank you. Good morning, Berlin. Can you hear me all right? All right, good morning, Berlin. My name is Steve Gannam, and I'm a product manager on Firebase Analytics, and I'm really excited to be here. It's my first time in Berlin, and I'm enjoying it very much. So I, I've had this date circled on my calendar uh, for months, because you launch a product, and you get all sorts of actionable feedback on it, and you're looking forward to that date when you can look your developers in the eye and tell them that you've heard that feedback and that you're making all sorts of progress towards addressing it. So I've been looking forward to this date for a long time, and today is the day that we get to tell you a lot about what we're doing for you. But before I get into that, I want to, talk, want to back up a little bit and provide some context 
for those of you who perhaps aren't as familiar with what Firebase Analytics has to offer. So we're going to back up a step and talk about what we aimed to launch and what we did launch this year. So the team at Google Analytics uh, endeavored to build a brand new app analytics solution called Firebase Analytics for developers that meets the needs of today's modern developers. And the core concepts, the things we just had to get right, are listed here. The first one is that it had to be free and unlimited. There's no compromise there. So free, what does that mean exactly? Free is kind of obvious. Unlimited refers to unlimited volume of events. Now, events are those things which you log in analytic solutions that correspond to user actions in your app. These are the things you want to measure. And we didn't want to introduce any sort of artificial limits on our developers or any paywalls that might you know, impede their ability to measure what's going on with their users. So it was critical, and we couldn't compromise on this, that developers need to be able to log everything that's important to them, even if, heaven forbid, your app becomes super popular. Right? You don't want to end up in the situation where it becomes so popular that you're then stuck you know, modifying your, your instrumentation to meet those limits. So first and foremost, free and unlimited. Secondly, we wanted to make sure there was automatic reporting so that it was just plug and play. You drop this SDK in your app, you initialize it, and it lights up. And we, we've achieved that by logging over a dozen events automatically for you. These are key events, things that measure user engagement, purchases, and those things. And over a dozen user and device properties, so you have some more context surrounding those events. In addition to that, those, those actually fuel a whole dashboard full of reporting for you, all with very, very little effort. So a lot of bang for the buck with Firebase Analytics. Thirdly, seamless integrations. There are Firebase and Google offer a host of mobile developer products. And there's some pretty obvious touch points between analytics and these other products. Our developers, like you, expect these things to work together and to know about each other's data. So wherever it can add value, analytics integrates with these other products so that your analytics data can make them smarter, more powerful for you, enable some great features for engagement, and analytics can act as a measurement layer for those features so then you can see what the results of your actions are. You'll be seeing a lot of examples of those today uh, throughout the summit. And lastly, cross-platform support for iOS and Android. Fire, yes, Firebase is a Google platform, and yes, we love iOS, because our developers have apps on iOS, and your users are on iOS, and we need to enable you to be successful wherever your apps are. So we're committed to a premium developer experience on iOS. One other really important point that I want to mention is that as much as we could have foresight in predicting all the ways you could use your data, and as much as we try to produce the reports that we think are right for your businesses, as much as we enable you to take action throughout Firebase on your data, we fully acknowledge that developers will have custom needs that we could never predict. And like in the, in the keynote, Ben was talking about TensorFlow and uh, you know, being able to to process your data using machine learning. We can't predict what you're going to want to do, because developers are really, really smart and find extremely creative ways to use your data, right? So it's imperative that you have access to your raw data to do those things. So that's why we, had to make, we made a way for you to do that at launch through our integration with BigQuery, which is Google's cloud data warehouse. If you link your Firebase app to BigQuery, then every day all of your raw, unsampled, event data with all of its parameters and context gets exported over to BigQuery. So you have the ability to process the same data we do. So this is what we launched with at I.O. this year. I'd like to take a look at how we've measured up based on your feedback to us. In terms of breadth, your ability to measure what's going on in the app, you're able to log up to 500 distinct types of events, so 500 distinct things going on in your app and to, cut, to contextualize those with up to 25 parameters. So it's not just that an item was purchased, but what is that item? It's not just that a song was listened to, but what's the title, the artist, the category? So the feedback we've gotten on that is very good, that you're able to measure what's going on in your app. Secondly, depth. Well, since it's free and unlimited, you know, that pretty much goes without saying we've heard good feedback about that. Uh, no one's complaining about free and unlimited, as you can imagine. So we're doing good on the depth front. Resolution. How, how much fine-grained access do you have to your analytics data? And this is where BigQuery comes in. And by providing that way to access your raw data, 
you see the same data that we do when we process it to produce your reporting. So the feedback's great. There's been a lot of developer interest in BigQuery. And the last category is latency. This one's more complicated, and there are actually multiple types of latency, so I want to spend more time on it because this is where we've gotten the majority of our feedback. So there's the first type of latency I'd like to discuss is the time to upload your events from the time it was logged to our back end. And the second type is the amount of time it takes for your reports to update and reflect that data that we received. That's something we refer to as report freshness. So on the first one, we're very, we upload, typically when you log an event on a device, it's scheduled to be uploaded an hour later, and any events that are logged in between get batched together and uploaded. This is because we're very conservative with your end user's resources. And we think it's, we're doing right by the end users, and you want to as well. It's in everyone's best interest to not be a resource hog on your end users' devices. So we're generally very conservative with that. On the reporting freshness, we update about every four to five hours every day to give you reports throughout the day. And the feedback that we've gotten from, on both of these things is pretty much this. But I want my data now, said every developer ever. And of course you do. And we recognize that. We recognize that the longer you have to wait to access your data, the harder it is to react to it, the less valuable it is. If you had to wait two weeks for your data, then how actionable is that? And to some degree, we trained you to want your data now, because Google Analytics had real-time reporting, so you, you definitely got used to that. And we understand how important it is. And so we've been taking that feedback to heart, and I wanted to share with you some of the things that we're doing about it now. So recently, we launched a change to the SDK for real-time conversions. So conversion events are your most important events. These are the events that you want every one of your users to log in, in your app. They distinguish a valuable user from just a casual user. And we don't know what those events are for your app. Every app's going to have a potentially different conversion, just like every app is different. So in our UI, you can actually go in there and identify up to 10 events, which are your conversion events, your ideal events. And those will be uploaded without delay. When we get, get them on the back end, we'll export them over to BigQuery. And that's important because of real-time export to BigQuery. This is something else we launched recently. So as soon as we get your data on the back end, right over to BigQuery it goes, if you linked your app to BigQuery. And I don't know if you, knew, if you pieced it together, but the implication is, of, of the two slides together, real-time conversions and real-time export to BigQuery, is real-time conversions in BigQuery. In other words, your most important events available in the raw to you in BigQuery, not in hours, not in minutes, but in seconds. So this is very powerful and enables you to respond to it, react to it, learn from it by applying business intelligence tools to it. And if you don't have a favorite business intelligence tool, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to plug one of my favorite products, which is Google Data Studio. And I use this for all of my apps. I'm an app developer, app developer background, and I got hooked on Data Studio. It's a way to... It's, it's, a very simple product that, with a visual interface, and it can, it can visualize all of your raw analytics data for you. Um, it's super easy to create custom dashboards, fully customizable, easy to share with everybody in your organization. And I want to show you a demo of it. So today, we launched Firebase Analytics report templates, which make it even easier to visualize your Firebase Analytics data in BigQuery. So can we switch to the demo so I can show this off? It's much easier to show it than just talk about it. All right, so this is Data Studio, and this is a sample report. We produced the teams at Firebase Analytics and Data Studio got together, and we, we made sure to expose all the metrics and dimensions that are really important to app developers, like yourselves. And from then on, it's just a visual interface to to look at the parameters and graphs, we have three, three pages of reporting here, a general dashboard, a look at your events, a look at your conversions, all of it entirely filterable in great detail from data that's in BigQuery for your app. And this is not just a sample for you to learn from. The point is that this template can be easily applied to your own data with just a few clicks in a matter of seconds. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to do it right now. So we have a link to this in our Help Center. You click on Use Template. 
You choose a different data source because you don't care about the sample. You want to look at your own data. I've created one here for myself. My game's uh, nicknamed Skate. You click Create Report. It spins for a little while. There it goes. So in just a few seconds, we've now applied this report to my own raw event data being exported from Firebase Analytics to BigQuery. From here, thank you. <laughs> from here, I'm free to customize it, make, make it look like something my, branded by my company that has just the metrics and reports we care about, whatever custom metrics that might be, and share that. And maybe if I'm not the most artistic person, you can invite people to collaborate here. So let me show you a few things you can do. So let's say that I wanted, instead of seeing device, uh, users by device category, I want to break this down and see some, some other metric or dimension. So right now it's device category. Uh, let's take a look at mm, country. It's just really easy to select a picker, choose some different dimension, get a different report on it. And then you can just drag and drop them, te edit text. It's a really familiar interface for doing all these things. So I really highly recommend that you check this out because Data Studio also offers a free tier. So you get up to five reports for free in Data Studio, and you can share them with an infinite number of people in your organization. And BigQuery offers a free query tier. And keep in mind that Data Studio is querying BigQuery for this data. And Firebase Analytics is free and unlimited in terms of its event collection. So this is, a, I think, a no-brainer for developers to check out. And I really highly encourage you to go to the Help Center today and look into this for your own apps. So that was a little bit of a detour. We were talking about latency. And I, got, you know, I wanted to pitch Data Studio there. So we talked about real-time conversions. We talked about real-time export to BigQuery. But there's a whole class of other developer feedback we've gotten that isn't addressed by these. And it comes in the form of the following types of questions. Is my app set up correctly? There's no real feedback telling you you've done things right or wrong. Which events are being captured by the SDK? Again, that goes back to that feedback. Are you receiving my events and parameters? We realize that because it takes sometimes four or five hours to see your reporting, even if you've done things right, you're not getting that feedback. And I'm really thrilled to tell you that we've built something, the ideal tool to answer all of these questions and these pain points. And it's called Debug View. This is real-time reporting for development. And this, again, I'd like to show you a demo of. So I'm going to demo it using a simple app that we've created. This is something, a code lab that we launched at I.O. This is called the Icon Shop. Really simple mock e-commerce app where you can buy icons. All right? This is an activity icon, airport icon. Again, just a mock app. You can add items to your cart. Right? You can check out. You can remove items from your cart. And I'm telling you these things because these actions correspond to events. So make mental note of, of what I'm doing. And then I'm checking out. Then you head over to Analytics, and there's this new tab. It's Debug View. And there you go. So you see the time I first opened the app, that I first opened it. This is an event logged on your behalf, one of the automatic events. That there was user engagement. The session started. More user engagement. And something else I want to call out here, it may be a little small and hard to see, but there's information there telling you what screen this was logged on. So we have launched automatic screen tracking as well. So you can tell which activities and which view controllers are in the foreground, and you'll know how much time users spent on each of these. So you'll know where users are spending time in your app. So you see here, it reads like a narrative, adding to cart, user engagement. So what did I add to the cart? The activity icon for 40 tokens, then the location icon for 15 tokens, and more. I'm going to go back over here and log a few more. So log 
I like this one. All right, so it, it's like a feed. So when you have new events, because we, we want to let you pause and actually analyze the data without it scrolling off screen, right? You need that ability. So you'll see the events accumulating up top. It says six new events, seven, et cetera. You click on that, those animate in, and you see more events here. You see my purchase being made there, how many tokens were made, how were spent, what screen that took place on. <clears throat> and this is one I really want to call out, this error event. What this corresponds to is an API error. So previously, so every, every analytics SDK you use has some rules about the length of event names and parameters or the characters that could be used, and in ours is no exception. And different SDKs handle that differently. The way we handle that is that we log an error event to let you know that you made a mistake. The goal is we want to inform you that your instrumentation isn't pristine. We would like you to update your instrumentation because the end goal is we want you to come through, pass through debug view and end with the perfect instrumentation of your app so that your measurement is as accurate as possible. So we need to give you that information. So we have all along been logging this event for you. We just haven't made it visible to you, so you really couldn't do anything about it. That is what debug view is going to tell you here. When you click on this error event, I know the font may be small there, so you can actually come up and if you'd like a demo later. It tells you what error code it is, and there's a web page that will tell you what that error means. And it gives you a reference value, letting you know what you tried to pass to us that we didn't like. So really easy, really actionable. You go and you find the place in the code where you're logging this event. You fix it. You come back in here. You verify that there's no more errors, and your instrumentation looks good. The other use case we wanted to make sure we handled here is that you've been using your app for a little while, and then you want to go and check and make sure that the the events that were logged jive with the experience that you had. So in the top right, you'll see the top events summary. That shows you all the events logged in the last 30 minutes. So you see that I added five events to the cart, or five items to the cart. Here it shows you the five instances of that, and you can look at the various items that were added. And for each one, you, can get, you get the timestamp of when it was logged and all the details associated with it. This is super comprehensive, and it should cover all the gamut of all these questions you were asking from knowing whether or not you integrated the SDK, that binary signal, to the finer grain signals of, am I logging everything correctly? The very first time I had access to this and used it with my app, I found analytics bugs that were there for over a year. It's, it's awesome actually using the product and seeing the value yourself. I, being the PM on analytics, I'm actually the guinea pig for it, and all of my apps get integrate our features first. So I feel your pain before you even feel it, and nothing is really a surprise to me. So when a tool like this comes around and makes my life easier, it's really easy for me to understand how valuable it will be to you, our developers. So that is Debug View, and thank you. <laughs> so if I'm predicting correctly, your reaction's going to be something like this. Awesome, when can I have it? And my response to you is, for you, today. So we're making this. <laughs> we're launching this today with limited availability. But in appreciation for your attendance here at the Dev Summit, we want to make sure everyone here can have access to it if they want. So just look for someone with a yellow shirt, well, a yellow shirt that says Firebase after this or any time throughout the day, and they'll show you how to get connected and uh, how to get access to Debug View. All right. So we've talked about our launch goals, and a summary of what we, what we endeavored to build and launch and what we did. We talked about the feedback we've received and how there was a lot of actionable feedback regarding um, the latency. We've introduced a few new features. And what's last here is a taste of the future. And where the, what, what I'm trying to tell you is that we understand how valuable real-time signals are and how users actually consume real-time reporting differently than they do the rest of their aggregate reporting. And we know this from talking to you and also from our experience with Google Analytics real-time reporting. And so we're, we're endeavoring to build something brand new that's very inspirational, that helps you connect with what's going on in your app right now. So I want to give you a sneak peek of the big brother of Debug View, which is called Stream View. This is an inspirational live view of your analytics data that's meant to inspire you give you insights into how your users are actually using your app, and give you immediate feedback 
of your engagement efforts with your app. And I want to show you a sneak preview of it. All right, so this is an, an early version of it, but operational, of a real app. Um, and this is the users who are using it now. And I want to point out that unlike your aggregate reporting, which just continues to add users to a report, this is dynamic in that users that weren't there this morning when I checked this, a lot of Americans woke up, are there now. And a lot of people who were there earlier are not. And that's, that's the element of now added to these reports that makes them so different from the rest of your reporting. <clears throat> so this first screen you land on is just a geo map showing you where your users are in the world. It's good and it's helpful, but you can go a lot deeper. So you can see the top user properties being logged by this app. So these user properties are the ones that you log based on information you either know about your users or inferred by their use of, the use of your app. One here is whether a wearable is available. You see that 25 wearables are available. Well, where are they in the world? You apply that as a filter, and you get to see who's using wearables in the world. It's that easy. Top locations, of course, you get your, your country's breakdown. But better than that, when you click on it, you get detailed information about what cities your users are in right now. And you can apply those as filters as well. You can also see what app versions your users are using, which is useful because when you're rolling new versions of the app out, you want to see that everybody's updating. And you see there's some stragglers here. And I wonder if there are any in Germany. <laughs> Let's see. So you apply that as a filter. Well, there might still be some old ones. In oh, look at that. Someone in, OK, you got lucky. I thought there would be someone in Berlin. <laughs> so Munich, someone in Munich's got to get with the program. <clears throat> but you can, you can also look at events. So users are, of course, who's using your app. Events are what's going in, on in my app, again, right now. So you always, there's always this element of right now. And we'll switch to that in a minute, but I want you to just think about how, how you would use this report. When we say this report is inspirational, a big part of that is we imagine like everyone in your organization wanting to take a look at this throughout the day. It's sort of a conversation piece in your reception area, maybe. And even guests who come in can take a look at it. So the map is one aspect of that, seeing how it changes dynamically throughout the day. But events are a big part of that as well, because that's what's going on in your app. And you want to monitor your KPI in real time. So switching over to events, you see the events that are being logged by your app now. And you see a whole host of them, whatever's going on, whatever we're collecting. This one right here, Play Selection, this is a radio app. So they can see what stories are popular in their app, what people are playing right now. So this can be another great insight. And you might want to know where are people listening to these stories. Again, you can apply it as a filter. And the whole report updates. So now you're seeing where this story is popular right now, who's listening to it. This gives you more insights and more connection to your users because because you know they're doing these things right now, you think about, well, if I send a notification, these are the sorts of people, this is what they're doing now, this is what it would be interrupting. So it gives you more of a connection, uh, intuitive connection to the users uh, who are on your app. You can also <clears throat> expand this to make it a more full-time, full-screen view and, and experience. So you can focus on it, and this will update dynamically as new events roll in. So this is another one of those showcase pieces. If you're an app that has, I think there's a use case for every app, really, but if you're an app that has like a search bar, you can see the top search terms. Or if you're an e-commerce app, the top items that are, that are being added to cart or purchased. If you're a radio app, the top tracks that are being listened to. Whatever it is, if you just have this in somewhere common in your workplace, imagine just how fun it would be to casually glance over there throughout the day and see what's trending. You might discover some things about the world and about trends going on based on what your users are consuming at that time. All right, so there's more features here. Um, location, just like with the users, you can filter by those to see what people are doing, for example, in New York, get more insights in how they're using it. So now that filters the rest of the reports, so you can see what events they're, they're actually logging and what app version. One more element to it, you can see a trend over the last 30 minutes. So this is the element of the a new dimension of time within real-time reporting to see if there are any spikes based on either what's going on in the world or what you've done manually to engage your users. Something that I think would be really powerful is if you, 
if you run any sort of engagement or install campaign, you can head to real time to see if people are responding to it the way that you thought. So if you launch a new version of your app, you head to real time and you see how many app updates are happening and where they're happening if you're rolling it out. Uh, if you launch a new app, you'll see first opens log all over the place. If you send push notifications that are meant to drive users to convert, this is going to be the place that you go to to get that immediate feedback of whether or not it's working. Email campaigns, dynamic links, whatever it is, this is your place for immediate feedback. And it's, um, I'm excited about all the use cases here. One new thing that we're doing that um, I'm especially excited about, I mean, I'm especially excited about all of it, right? But, <laughs> but, and it's really neat to see it with real live data in an app, is user snapshots. User snapshots, and if it looks like debug view, it's intentional. Just like in debug view, you, it reads like a narrative, the stream of events and timestamps logged by your development devices. Uh, it's, user snapshot gives you a snapshot of the events logged by real users in the real world with timestamps and the sequence all preserved with the parameters and all those things. So the, the inspiration behind this was focus testing. I don't know how many of you have either taken part and been subject to a focus test or have run one yourself, but typically you get a group of people together from a demographic and you want to see how they use your product. And you'd be surprised how often people use your product differently than you thought they would. And that's so true with apps as well. So what you can do is you can actually select users who are in a certain demographic, certain country, certain app version, click on user snapshots, and it's going to select people randomly from that, from that criteria, show the events that they're logging on their devices, so you can get a sense of what they're doing in your app, what screens they're transitioning to, uh, maybe if they run into crashes. And you can cycle through next and previous, so you can compare that to someone else in the demographic, giving you a better idea of maybe it's a fluke or maybe this is something common in that region. So a totally new way to think about your analytics data that real-time enables that can help you give you more insight into how a group of people uses your app, perhaps differently than you thought. All right, so in conclusion, just to sum up what we launched and where we were going, Firebase Analytics is free and unlimited, automatic reporting, seamlessly integrated with other Firebase features, actionable, which we'll hear more about throughout the summit, access to raw data to do with it what you please, and now, up and coming, live reporting. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. Now, now I'm going to hand it over to Francis Ma, lead PM for Firebase. He'll talk to you about some more releases that will help you build better apps. Francis? Hello, everyone. My name is Francis Ma, and I'm the lead PM for Firebase. So as you heard earlier, we've been hard at work since releasing the new Firebase at Google I.O. We've been making a lot of updates across iOS, Android, and web. So the exciting updates you saw from Steve earlier, I have even more to share with you today. Over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about some of the updates and how Firebase can help you build a better app and some of the tools and resources to help you integrate with Firebase more easily. So let's start with ways and how Firebase can help you build a better app. There it is. So one of the most basic yet often difficult ways of ensuring user engagement is to make sure that your app is of high quality and crash free. And as users, we've all experienced this. When an app crashes, is very frustrating, sometimes so much so that I would go and leave a negative review in the App Store. Now, as developers and business owners, this could be detrimental. And that's one of the key motivations where we've released Firebase Crash Reporting, to give you a tool where you can monitor errors that are happening out in the wild. And since releasing this at Google I.O. a few months ago, we had offered this as a beta product as a way to really collect feedback and continue to work with the community to make sure that we can hone in on the features. And now, we're very excited to share that Firebase Crash Reporting is out of beta with several new updates. First, we've improved the user workflows so that you can mark individual, uh, individual errors as fixed and you can track which ones have been fixed by you. 
And also, we've added email alerts so you get notified when new errors or regressions happen. Now, as developers, we want our data now. And uh, previously, with crash reporting, it could take up to 20 minutes before when an error happens on the end user device before, until it, it's reported into the dashboard. We've been working really hard at this, and now we're happy to share that it's near instant with sub-minute latency. We've also strengthened the integration of crash reporting and Firebase analytics. So in addition to just showing you the errors that are happening in the field, we're now also showing you the list of the trail of analytic events that are leading up to these errors. So not only do you get to see when these errors are happening, but the context in which it happened. For example, if you're building an e-commerce app, you can see whether an error happened on some edge case, like the users modifying their profile, or it happened during a critical checkout flow that has real and direct impact on your business. So we believe showing this insight not only helps you diagnose and fix the problem sooner, but also able to prioritize these errors to see how it actually impacts your business. In addition to monitoring the errors that are happening on the field, a better way is to prevent them from happening in the first place. With the diversity of the Android ecosystem, we've heard from developers that it's often not as easy to get access to devices to test on. And that's where we've created Test Lab for Android. Today, we're excited to share that we have increased the number of uh, new devices available through a test lab to give you even more access to new devices and popular devices to test on. We've also made available the latest version of Android N, the 7.1, which is currently in developer preview. So that means you can get test, test your app on that now to make sure that your app is ready on day zero when this version is released. Lastly, We've also heard feedback from developers and wanting to, test, to, to try out Test Lab, but don't want to go through the process of setting up a credit card. And so we're also introducing a new free pricing tier for you to try out Test Lab, running up to 10 tests per day without having to set up a credit card. So if you've not tried out Test Lab for Android, now is a great opportunity to do that. So I've just talked about how um, Firebase has updates to help you build a better app, and this is really important. In fact, we're going to have a follow-on session at 1.30 p.m. today to talk about how, how um, the, the Firebase can help you use some of these tools in more details with live demo. But let's switch gears a bit to talk about some of the new updates we have for you and how Firebase helps you integrate more easily. First, I want to start with an update on Firebase cloud messaging. Cloud messaging is the infrastructure that provides push notifications on iOS and Android, and it's a high-scale, reliable infrastructure used by hundreds of thousands of apps, including many of Google's own. We're very excited to share that we've expanded the capabilities to the web with a new JavaScript SDK. With the JavaScript SDK, this means implementing uh, FCM and web push notifications much easier because the SDK takes care of the complex client-side logic, like implementing your own service worker, or the server-side logic, like managing payload encryption, automatically for you. So it's a really easy way to get started. And if you've already integrated FCM on iOS or Android or on the server-side, you can bring over a lot of the existing capabilities and expand that to the web functionalities like uh, topic-based targeting or device group targeting. So if you have a web app, this is a really easy way to get started. Be sure to check that out. Another update I want to share is the Firebase UI library. Oftentimes, when you're integrating with Firebase, it involves working with UI elements. For example, if you're building Firebase authentication, you might need to create a user login screen or if you're serving an image that's backed by uh, Firebase storage, you have to write some client-side code as well. And this is where Firebase UI helps you. We've been making a lot of enhancements on this, and now we're officially bringing this up to version 1.0. And with this update, one of the really cool features is providing an out-of-box login UI 
that incorporates a lot of the best practices that we've learned over the years to help you implement a login screen to really maximize the user conversion. So if you're using Firebase authentication, this is a great way for you to help bootstrap your UI experience. In addition to that, we've also added the ability to uh, load and display an image that is backed by Firebase storage, as well as um, adding functionalities to help you manage your Firebase database data, like doing joins and interactions on the client side. This is an open source library that's available on GitHub, and you can get that for iOS, web, and Android. Another update is on the Firebase command line interface and a new admin SDK that we'd like to share with you. Now, we recognize that programmatic access is really important, especially for those of you with a sophisticated setup. And that's where we have added, we've created the uh, Firebase CLI in the first place to provide a way for you to integrate that into your development workflow. Examples like integrating with your continuous integration system to be able to kick off t uh, tests automatically with TestLab or deploying them automatically to Firebase hosting. And one of the new features that we're excited to share with you is the, build, is the ability to import and bulk migrate your existing user database into Firebase authentication through the CLI. This has been one of the top features we've heard from the community, so we're very excited to share with you that to share that with you today. Switching gears to the admin SDK. This is a brand new SDK designed to give you programmatic access uh, using a server-side admin account. So you can do things like manage your uh, authentication user data or use that uh, to, to have full read-write access of your database data. Really, a lot of programmatic access that you would want to do as opposed to coming to the UI console and have to do that manually. We're just getting started on this front, so if you have specific use cases in mind, we'd love to hear from you as well. Now, for the game developers out there, we have something for you too. We know that many game developers build games using C++ or popular game engines like Unity. And today, we're excited to share a new Unity plugin for Firebase as well as our expansion of the C++ SDK. So if you're a game developer, now it's really easy to get started with Firebase. Be sure to check that out. So we've just talked about how Firebase helps you build better apps with tools like Crash Reporting and Test Lab, as well as some of the tools to help you integrate Firebase more easily. Now I'm going to talk about some of the new resources that we've created to help you learn more about Firebase and to get started. Now, one of the best ways to learn is through hands-on interaction. And that's where we've created this new Firebase demo project, which allows you to try Firebase with real data, hands-on, even before you've written a line of code. So this project is based on a real app, a game called Flooded, that you can download on iOS and Android. And we've integrated this project um, with several Firebase features like analytics, notifications, remote config, crash reporting, et cetera. And through this demo, you can, try, you can, you can get hands-on interaction to do things like drill in on the analytics report, see some of the errors that are happening in crash reporting, or even see some of the notifications funnel. You can get access to this demo project through that URL below. And to give you guys a taste of what it's like, I'm going to ask my colleague Doug to demo that to you. All right, thank you, Francis. Uh, so it's really easy to get started. Uh, the easiest way is probably to just go to firebase.google.com, uh, scroll down, and there's a link for try a demo. If you click that, that will take you to a help page that describes what you need to do. It basically boils down to joining a Google group, and if you uh, follow that link, you can join the group. It can take a couple minutes to get started, but once that's been added to your account, there's a link to go directly to the Firebase demo project in the console. Uh, and so we'll, what we can see here is that there's an Android app and an iOS app. Um, before we go any further, I'll actually show you how to install this. So uh, to get Flood It from the store, simply search for Flood It. Um, choose the one from Lab Pixies. That's our app. I already have that installed, so I will go ahead and run it. 
uh, and I'll play a quick, uh, quick play version. So the goal of the game is to convert the entire screen to the same color, and you do that by um, changing the color of the area that you control, and I'm just kind of playing randomly right now. I intend to uh, fail this game. Uh, so eventually when I run out of steps, it's telling me I have five more steps that I can spend. Um, and if I ran out of steps, it will ask me to do an in-app purchase so I can buy more steps. So the, uh, let's look at how this looks in the console. So if we go to analytics, you can see that the dashboard is created entirely from automatically generated data. There's nothing you have to do, no lines of code that you have to write. Simply integrating the SDK will get you a fully formed dashboard. Um, you can see how uh, usage is going. And there's an interesting spike here on the third. And I'll go into that later. So what I can do is look at the events for this app. Um, and if I expand this out, I can see all the events. This is both automatically generated events and events that have been custom coded. And there's a particularly interesting one, a special one called Select Content. And when I drill into that, I can see the different kinds of content that's, um, that's being added here. Oh, hmm. I don't hope we don't have a demo fail. Oh, my screen's wider, so it looks a little different than I'm used to. So you can see that there are levels, modes, board types, and in-app purchases. So I want to see what kind of levels are being, per, are, are being selected here. And I can see that uh, it looks pretty normal, except there's this strange level 27. I don't know why that's so high. Why is this level so common? I don't really know. I could take a guess, but I don't know. Um, so there's another event that I can look at that's being logged. It's called spend virtual currency. And virtual currency in this game are those extra steps that you can buy. So I can see again that people are spending a lot of virtual currency on level 27. And this is kind of telling me maybe this level is just too hard. Maybe I should ratchet down the level or the difficulty of this level to make it a little bit easier so people aren't getting stuck. And these are the kind of insights that you can get into your app uh, by using analytics. Now I'd also like to show you uh, remote config. So we're using remote config in this app to perform some experiments. And there's one uh, value here that we're changing uh, in four different buckets. So the, in the number of initial steps can either be 5, 10, 20, or 3. Now when I launched the app, I was in the 5 bucket. So th this is where I was landing. So you can test to see uh, how variance on this number affects the usage of your app. So if you switch back over to analytics, um, I can do a funnel analysis, and there's a number of funnels here. The one I'm interested in is extra step compulsion, which measures uh, the progression from running out, of it, running out of steps to actually buying more steps. And so for each one of those groups, I can take a user property. Uh, the user property is initial extra steps, and I could compare the people who get three initial steps who are looking at uh, a 1.9% per conversion rate. I can compare that to people who have 20 uh, extra steps, which is an 8.3% conversion rate. So I can compare and contrast and see which one of these options will actually make my app more money, which is you know, very good to know. And the last thing I'd like to show you is uh, notifications. So with Firebase notifications, you can send messages directly to users of your app. And so you can see here, there's a list of notifications we sent. Uh, the most recent notification is a challenge to complete a level. And you can see here that uh, out of the number of messages that were sent, 2% of them were clicked on, and 5% of those clicks turned into conversions. And I believe a conversion in this case is defined as someone who actually went and completed a level. Now, this message was sent on November 3rd, um, and so what I'll do is I'll go back to analytics and point out that the overall usage of the app, um, remember that spike that was on November 3rd, that directly correlated to the message that was sent out. So you can see, uh, when you send Firebase notifications, how that affects the overall usage of your app. So analytics ties together these components very well, um, and you can use this demo app to figure out how you might want to instrument your app and what you could do to better understand how users are using it. And that's all I've got. Back to Francis. Great. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> so you just saw the, the very cool demo, and uh, you can access that directly on the front page of firebase.google.com. It's really a good way for, it's really an easy way for you to learn Firebase if you haven't, or it's a good way for you to also use that to show to your colleagues on what Firebase can do. Another resource that we've created is a new online course for Firebase on Udacity. Udacity is the one of the largest online learning platforms for developers. 
Google has over 45 online courses with over 1.8 million students enrolled. And now we have a new course called Firebase in a Weekend, which gives you an instructor-led interactive video session to, you, to help you, jump, you jumpstart into iOS and Android development. So if you are looking to get started on Firebase or you're looking to expand your integration, this is a great course where you can complete in just two days. <coughs> So we're very excited to have you here and be able to share the updates that we've been working really hard on over the past couple of months. And we're going to continue to work hard. So we're really looking forward to get the feedback from the community, as always, to help us continue to refine our product and to work together to help you build a better app and grow a more successful business. Thank you.